Let's bow our heads. Our Father God, uh, we're so thankful to be able to gather together as uh, as children of God and uh, members of our church. We ask your blessings upon our pastor and our congregation. Uh, help each and every one of us uh, overcome disappointments and uh, things that uh, just uh, affect our lives. We're so grateful to have, uh, Kath, uh, have Carolyn here this morning and the rest of the group. We pray uh, for those who are not here today and help us uh, learn from your word. In thy name we pray. Amen. Um, I kind of summarized a little bit where we're at. We're reaching the end. There are only a couple more uh, chapters left in our study. Uh, my intent is to, after we finish Revelations, is to remove, is to move into the minor prophets, which, uh, for me anyhow, and for those of you who have been in our class for uh, the last couple years, it will be a call, kind of a culmination of we've we've hit just about every. Every book in the Old Testament at least touched on them, and uh, we've done a pretty good job in the New Testament. We keep going back and forth, um, so I'm looking forward to that study when we when we finish here. Uh, we know that the seven bowls of wrath and ended God's judgment against non-believers. Uh, and all of this, and all of these judgments that God brings upon the earth here at the end times. His entire purpose is to make non-believers change their ways. And, you know, I, I can remember time and time again um, in the study of the Old Testament where we would say to ourselves after the Israelites had failed and had been disciplined and they came back and we would say to ourselves, you know, if that had been me, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have turned around. But, you know, that just doesn't happen. And... The amazing part of this story as we get to the end is even, even in times of a thousand years of peace where there is no evil on the earth, there are still people who um, do not believe. And after Satan is released, we'll get to this in, in the lesson today, after Satan is released from the bottomless pit, he still managed to collect all of these evil people to engage in a final battle against the Lord. So we human beings are pretty amazing characters and uh, there's just there's just something about us that doesn't make us perfect. The only time we get perfect is when we uh, accept the Lord and move in the direction of perfection. Something to keep in mind. Uh, last Sunday we saw the vision of John's vision of the great prostitute Remember, the, the great Babylon represented religious idolatry, and it was personified by the Roman Empire, um, who rode into our vision. I think we had a, a picture of it that I pass around uh, on this um, beast of uh, seven, seven heads and ten horns. Um, the beast itself represented the political and economic systems set up by Satan, through his earthly stand-ins, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and, and although the harlot, the Babylon the Great, was the symbol of Rome for John's day, uh, it's still very easy for us to point out and find similar idol worshiping gone on uh, in our own history, things of the world that allure us away from God. It doesn't have to be worshiping a uh, golden statue or a carving out of wood. It can be prosperity. It can be subtle changes in our society. It can be new laws. Uh, there are just so many things that, uh, you know, the affluence that we, that we all have. None of us in here really are who I would call in the poverty level. So we, we all are comfortable, typically, in our, in our environment. And sometimes even that can lure us away from the things that are important. So because false religions and economic and political oppression of Rome was used against God's people, 
there was rejoicing for God's judgment when Rome is destroyed. <clears throat> and when the end times come, it won't <clears throat> be Rome, but it will be a modern day empire that will be ruled by the beast, the dragon, the Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And all will be destroyed, just as John prophesied. So the question we probably may have asked when we started this study was, how's the world going to end? Uh, historians have studied the past uh, time and time again, hoping to find a clue of the understanding of the future. Um, so in Revelations 19 and 20, which we're going to cover today, uh, John records five events that will take place before God wraps up history. So it gets kind of confusing. I try to organize some of this stuff. Um, uh, so there are five events that are going to happen before God ends history. Uh, in the process, John uses a literary technique uh, where he sees visions. So there are seven visions that will take place in 19 and 20, and they all start with, I saw. We have been identifying throughout Revelations what we call the seven Beatitudes, the seven blessings, and we'll come across one of those today. So um, if you haven't already, you probably ought to be uh, having a lot of marks in your Bible and um, clearly identifying whether it's an event or a vision or a blessing. I just try to point these out to you so that you can uh, understand in a different kind of way what we're reading. So the first event that we're going to study this morning is heaven rejoicing. Worship in heaven again. Uh, there's no book in the Bible that's more clear about what takes place in heaven than the book of Revelation. Um, who's there? The elders, the 24 elders, the multitude of martyrs, um, you know, the angels around the the lamp stands, of course, the Lord in his throne room, and uh, lots of singing and lots of worship. Um, so heaven rejoices when Babylon falls. Um, and the command was given that heaven would rejoice. Uh, the destruction mentioned in the readings that we have in heaven's hallelujah was was the fall of Babylon and the great her uh, Hera harlot in chapter 17 but the praise is not for the death of the sinners the praise is for god's truth and righteousness um, god vindicated the blood of his people who were who were killed during the tribulation and so let's open uh, and again i'm reading from the voice i enjoy this translation it's also a, a small book that helps me handle a little bit better uh, when I prepare my lessons, I, I do like the NIV better, but I like the way the voice reads. And so I'm in uh, chapter 19, the first four verses. The scene changed. After this, I heard the great sound of a multitude echoing in heaven. Praise the Lord. Salvation and glory and power truly belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has judged the great whore who polluted the entire earth with their sexual immorality, and he has vindicated the blood of his servants, which he shed. Again, praise filled from heaven. The multitude sings, praise the Lord. The smoke rises up from her ruins forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces and worshiped God who reigns on the throne. And the four creatures and the 24 elders say, amen, praise the Lord. The next praise is given for God's reign. God has been reigning in heaven, but now he's about to conquer the thrones of earth and Satan's kingdom and move his kingdom to the earth as he has always promised. So we'll continue with verses 5 and 6. Give praise to our God, all of you, God's servants, all who reverence him, small and great. And I heard what seemed to be an immense crowd speaking with one voice. It was like the sound of roaring waterfall, like the sound of cl clashing thunder. In unison, the multitude said, Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the all-powerful, reigns supreme. <clears throat> um, next, this...
praise and worship in heaven takes on the air of a wedding. Now, we all have been to weddings, I'm sure, and it's a joyful occasion. Uh, there's lots of joy, there's singing, there's dancing typically, lots of food, jokes, um, a lot of affection, and so in heaven we have actually two metaphors. Um, God and Israel as a bride and groom, and Christ and the church as a bride and groom. And so uh, the praise and the joy that we read about next is that of a wedding. Um, today the church is engaged to Christ. Remember, the church is not this building. It's you and I sitting around here. It's the people in our uh, in our congregation. Um, Jesus is alive in heaven. And one day he will return and he'll take us to heaven where our works will be judged. And at the end, we'll return to earth with Jesus to live forever. And that's what's happening in this last couple chapters. God and his people are about to become one, symbolized by marriage. The bride of God, Israel, and the bride of Christ, our church, are about to become one. And the wedding guests, they're the believers from the Old Testament and the tribulation. Um, and in this passage we're about to read, they receive the fourth of the seven Beatitudes, the blessings that we've been identifying in Revelation. So I'm in verse 7. Now is the time for joy and happiness. He deserves all the glory we can give him. For the wedding feast has begun. The marriage of the Lamb to his bride has commenced. His bride has prepared herself for this glorious day. She had been given the finest linens to wear, linens bright and pure, woven from the righteous deeds of the saints. Write this down, and here's the blessing. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. What am I telling you are the true words of God. At that time, I fell down at his feet to worship him. He's, this is John so grateful and so inspired that he falls down at the feet of the angel, the messenger, and, but he refused my praise. He said, the guide says, stop, don't you see? I'm a servant like you and your brothers and sisters, all who hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. Address your worship to God, not to me. For the testimony about Jesus is essentially the prophetic spirit. Um, John was so overwhelmed that he fell down to worship the wrong the wrong person. We've seen that a couple times uh, in the scriptures where um, people are so thankful for the response or the servitude shown by somebody that they start to worship them when in fact they should be worshiping the Lord who gave that person the power. So the first event was celebration and worship in heaven. The second event is um, necessary to happen, uh, one of five, before the end times come, and that is Christ returns a second time. Remember, what started all this off was Christ came back for the rapture and picked up all the Christians on the earth and took them to heaven. And he has been back in heaven until now. And his return ends the tribulation, ends the judgment, ends all the misery that uh, Satan has brought with his two compatriots uh, to the people on earth. So in a literary construction, now this is just the way John does it, as I mentioned before, uh, he has seven visions through chapter 20, uh, which occur preparatory to the end. And each vision begins with the phrase, I see. So you'll see it in your Bible, and I'll point it out to you. Uh, the first vision ends in, uh, begins, or happens, <laughs> in verse 1911, when John says, I saw heaven open, and a white horse appears with Christ as its rider. So in the first uh, return by Christ, it's a rapture. He comes down from heaven. In the second, it's a little bit more dramatic, uh, at least the way John sees the vision. He comes on a white horse. The rider is called Faithful and True. 
He has piercing eyes like fire and a crown on his head. He is, in this case, without a doubt, the conquering Christ in a robe dripped in blood. And we know what that represents. So I'm in 19 verse 11. I looked up and I saw what heaven had opened. Suddenly a white horse appeared. Its rider is called Faithful and True. With righteousness he exercises judgment and wages war. His eyes burn like flaming fire and his head are many crowns. His name was written before the creation of the world. And no one knew it except he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name he is known by is the word of God. Now, I want to interrupt right here for a minute, and I'll come back and read this again. But I want to go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and read the first five verses. And I want to come back to this because you'll recognize the similarities, and that's one of the things that gives us a hint that John, the book, the author of John in the Gospel, and John, the author of the book of Revelation, are the same author. And so I'm in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And I, I have switched to the NIV here. And the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now let me go back and read again what it says in Revelation. I looked up and I saw that heaven had opened. And I'll skip down. Uh, his name was written before creation of the world. And no one knew it except he himself. He was dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. And the name he was known by, the word of God. So... Christ is the Word. Christ uh, was here at creation. Uh, many like to think, uh, I'm one of them, that uh, he was a very prominent part of God's creation that we read about in Genesis. And so the words go on. And the armies of heaven outfitted in fine linen, white and pure, were following behind him on white steeds. From his mouth darts a sharp sword. That's a, that's a symbol that we've used throughout the uh, the book uh, a sharp sword is really divine judgment and that'll come into play later he will rule over them with a scepter made of iron he will trample the wine press to the fury of the wrath of god the all-powerful and there on his robe and on his thigh was written his name king of kings and lord of lords uh, as i said it's very easy to see the similarities between these words in Revelation with that in uh, the opening verses of the Gospel of John. So now John sees a second vision, and again, that second vision will open up, I saw. He sees an angel standing in the sun who calls and, um, and calls all vultures <laughs> to gather at a feast of those enemies who are going to fall in battle with God's army. So he's, he's giving us a precursor to the final battle that will take place and they're actually going to be two this will be the, the one before the final and of course these are not descriptions of real occurrences but they're symbols uh, that um, evil will be overthrown and so in verse 17 it says then I looked up and I saw that's the second vision a messenger standing in the sun with a loud voice he called out to all the birds that fly through the mid heaven, the messenger says, Come, gather for the great feast God is preparing for you, where you will feast on the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the rich and powerful, the flesh of horses and their riders, all fresh, both free and slave, both small and great. I went to my granddaughter's soccer game yesterday, and as we were sitting there at halftime uh, just talking, this uh, buzzard. We see them flying up high in the sky. He he swooped down. It was it was, it was kind of an ominous sign. I wasn't sure what what it meant, but he was low enough. He could see the red comb on his on his head, you know. And as I read this this morning, that's what I thought about. That God is calling all these vultures. Uh, if if and, and I'll go back and read um, 
uh, excerpt out of uh, out of Ezekiel that has the same kind of idea. In Ezekiel, he talks about the the final battle of Gog and Magog, which is not this battle, but the one that comes in chapter later. Um, he talks about there's so much death and bodies lying around that he's called all these vultures to come and enjoy the feast. Then John, um, then John sees a third vision, again identified by I saw, of a final battle between good and evil. Uh, the beast and the kings of the earth come face to face against Christ and his armies. Uh, John is not, again, describing a military campaign, but he's describing a spiritual struggle. And we'll notice that even though Christ has all these this vast army behind him on these white steeds, they don't, he doesn't need them. They don't even enter into the battle. So I'm on verse 19. I looked down and I saw, again, the vision. The beasts I had seen earlier and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered together to wage war against the one riding the white horse and his heavenly army. The beast was soon captured with the false prophet. Now the beast is the Antichrist. And the false prophet is kind of his PR guy who kind of uh, creates uh, in the tribulation. This, uh, he, he actually brings him back to life. Uh, the Antichrist is the political leader of the group. The earth beast I had seen earlier who performed signs to deceive those. He's talking about the false prophet now who had agreed to receive the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its detestable things, image. Both of them were thrown into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and that's the picture that you have in front of you. And all who remained met death at the blade of the sword that proceeded from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. Again, the sword coming out of the mouth of Christ is divine judgment. All the birds feasted fully on their flesh. So John only portrays the result. He doesn't, he doesn't give us a whole lot of detail about the battle. Um, we know that they are captured and thrown into the lake of fire. And for us, uh, that's another description of hell. Um, you know, Ezekiel, as I mentioned, prophesied a similar battle. And I'm just briefly... In verse 39, in chapter 39 of Ezekiel, and I'll just read a couple verses quickly here to give you the same sort of idea. And this is why, without the study of Ezekiel, without the study of Daniel, without some references in uh, the Gospels, without some words out of Paul's book of Thessalonia, um, Revelation would really be a strange book. I mean, strange enough. But uh, once you know and read those other books, then it becomes more clear. You cannot study the book of Revelation without understanding and looking at Daniel beforehand. So I'm in uh, Ezekiel 39, verse 2. I will turn you around and lead you. I will bring you from the remote regions of the north and send you up against uh, Israel's mountains. But just when you, and he's talking about the evil armies. He's talking about the armies of God. I will knock the bow out of your left hand and the arrows out of your right hand. Right then and there on the mountains of Israel, you will meet your end, you and all your troops and everyone in your coalition. I will feed your remains to the predatory birds and wild beasts and deny you an honorable burial. You will fall and be defeated in the open fields. I, the eternal Lord, have spoken. So again, this... Uh, rather ominous picture of uh, vultures circling the field of dead bodies is not new uh, in our scriptures, certainly. Now John has a fourth vision. He opens chapter 20 uh, with this fourth of seven visions. And now that Christ has taken care of the Antichrist and the false prophet, he turns his attention to the dragon. Remember the dragon uh, that we've talked about before, which represents Satan. Uh, the bottomless pit spoken here is the same as, is not the same as hell, but rather it is the abyss that we've talked about before. If you remember 
when the locusts and their leader Apollon came out of the abyss, same, same place um, in chapter 9. And so the beast with seven heads and ten horns of chapter 11, uh, he is not cast into hell yet. It's interesting. God has one more task for him to do. We, we kind of think that he operates and roams the earth and does whatever he wants to do, but uh, remember, even in the book of Job, uh, when it talked about, uh, God says, so well, what have you been doing? He said, I've been walking around the earth. And he said, have you seen my good friend Job? And, and you know, Satan is not allowed to do anything with Job unless God says. And the same thing is true here. Um, and so... Um, now Satan is bound with the chain, and he's confined to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And so, Revelation 20, first three verses. Then I saw a messenger coming from heaven. In his hand was a key to the abyss, and a great chain that had been forged in heaven. I can remember my dad reading this to me, and I, uh, you know, as a kid, you can almost, I don't know, <laughs> there are lots of images that you can have in your head of... Uh, God wrapping this big chain around Satan. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years with the great chain. The messenger cast him into the abyss and locked it and sealed him in it so that he could not go about deceiving nations until the thousand years had come to completion. Afterwards, he must be released for a short time. Seems kind of interesting mm -hmm. that God would do that. Why not just uh, send him into the abyss? Um, so here's the situation, right? The Satan's two henchmen are in, in the lake of fire. They're in hell. Satan is bound. There is no perpetuator of evil on the earth for a thousand years. Uh, you would think it, was a, it would be a good time for people to coalesce around goodness, right? Uh, to take that opportunity of peace and well-being, to make it uh, advantageous. Um, so having taken care of his enemies, the Lord now is free to establish his righteous kingdom on earth. And this is the third event, that Christ comes to earth in victory, defeats the enemies of evil, Satan is thrown into the, uh, into the abyss for a thousand years, and Christ establishes his kingdom on earth. How many times have we read that in the Bible that said God promises that my kingdom will be established on earth and Christ will be the guy in charge? So the saints, those who live through the tribulation, uh, will reign for a thousand years. Now, this millennium, that's what it's called, a thousand years, the millennium, has probably created more questions in Christendom than uh, many other things. Uh, two of them, and I'm not going to get into them, but one of them has to do with whether or not this a thousand years is it really a thousand years, or is it just symbolic of a period of time? Um, in my opinion, it really doesn't matter uh, what happens, whether it's ten years or a thousand years, it's just a period of time. The second thing, um, I don't know how consequential it is, but there's a question about whether or not Christ comes at the beginning of that thousand years, like we, like I've just explained, or whether he comes at the end of the thousand years. Uh, if you believe, and I'm, I'm only teaching it one way, I'm not espousing that necessarily that that's the only way, but if, if you learn it the way I've taught it this morning, you're called a premillennialist. In other words, Christ comes before the millennium. If, if you believe that Christ comes after the millennium, then you're a post-millennialist. <laughs> and, and then there are two other thoughts on that. One is entirely symbolic. It has nothing to do with actual time. And um, another one is that it's, it's a reference to things that happen in actual history. So <clears throat> how important is that? I, I don't think it's very important. I think the important thing is that we recognize that God is in charge, evil is defeated, and right now there's going to be a period of time where evil does not reign on earth and Christ is in charge. Um, the other 
thing that we should recognize is that, you know, when we studied Ezekiel, remember the last eight chapters, we talked about this period of peace and uh, the building of this new temple and this whole area uh, of um, Palestine being divided up in a certain way. And um, this was Ezekiel's promise to the people during the time of Israel's destruction of what they had to look forward to, that God was going to take care of his people, the Jews, not the Christians, going to take care of because he had promised that. Well, this a thousand years also is a promise to the Jews that their blessings, and it is during this time where uh, we think Ezekiel's temple, which was, we spent eight chapters on that, in great detail about how it was being constructed and, and where the priests worked and what the buildings had. Uh, all of that is going to be part of this period of peace, this millennium. So during the millennium, those who died during the tribulation because of their faith and they resisted the beast and his henchmen, they'll be brought back to life and blessed. This is called the first resurrection. So when Christ came back to rapture, he picked up all the Christians, right? Then the tribulation started, and seven years, whether it's seven years or 700 years, it really doesn't matter. But during that tribulation, people who turned to Christ were persecuted by the powers of earth. And God brought judgments against the powers of earth and those who did not believe. Because remember, all the believers during the tribulation had the mark on their head, and they were not subject to those disasters, those plagues that, that God brought. Um, and so now, those people who died as martyrs during that tribulation are brought to life. And that's called the first resurrection. We'll get to the second resurrection later. Uh, so I'm in verse 4. Then I saw, again, that's, that's the fifth vision, some thrones, and those seated in judgment were given the right to judge. Standing there were the souls of their testimony of Jesus and the word of God. They had refused to worship the beast in its detestable image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or upon their hands. So there were two marks, right? God marked the Christians who believed so that they would not suffer the judgments. And then there was the mark of the beast. The beast forced people to have a mark on them, 666, so that they could buy food, you know, be part of uh, the benefits of the government, how evil it was at the time. They had come back to life and reigned with the Anointed One, our liberating king for a thousand years. Now, as for the rest of the dead, they were not given life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. So we have the martyrs of the tribulation are brought back to life, but all those who have died throughout the years from the beginning of the world are still dead. And when they're brought back, that would be the second resurrection. And we'll talk about that later. Um, now, um, what's, <laughs> what's the purpose of the millennium? Whether you believe it's actually a thousand years or whether you believe it's just a period of time, uh, the purpose is the fulfillment of God's promise. And we say, well, where's the promise? Where do we read that? Well, let's, let's take a few examples. Uh, Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. I am telling you all of the truth I have heard the Eternal's decree. He said clearly to me, you are, the son, you are my son, today I have become your father. The nation shall be yours for the asking, and the entire earth will belong to you. They are yours to crush with an iron scepter, yours to scatter like fragile clay plots. So leaders, kings, and judges be wise and war, be warned. There is only one God, the eternal. Worship him with respect and awe. Take delight in him and tremble. Bow down before God's son. If you don't, you will face his anger and tribulation, and you won't stand a chance, for it doesn't take long to kindle royal wrath. But blessings await all who trust in him. They will find God a gentle refuge. And I'll go back. 
where it says, I will become your father, the nations will be yours for asking, and the entire earth will belong to you. Another example, Luke chapter 1. Verse 30 to 33. You'll recognize this. Mary, don't be afraid. This is the angel Gabriel coming to Mary to announce her uh, impending pregnancy. You have found favor with God. Listen, you are going to be pregnant. You will have a son. You must name him Savior or Jesus. Jesus will become the greatest among men. He will be known as the Son of the Highest God. God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over the covenant family of Jacob forever. Remember what God promised David. He said, your descendants will reign forever and ever. And here the angel is telling Mary, the son you are about to have, Jesus, who is an ancestor, a descendant of King David, will be the subject of this Davidic covenant that he will reign forever. And so Christ dies. And when the end of time comes, Christ will come back to the earth and reign forever. And notice that it also says he will reign over the covenant family of Jacob. Who's that? Uh, those are the Jews. So God is going to promise that. And if we stay in Luke uh, chapter 22. And this will also be familiar to you. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and in verse 28 of chapter 22, he says this to them. You have stood beside me faithfully through my trials. I give you a kingdom, just as the Father has given me a kingdom. You will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will have authority over the twelve tribes of Israel. And when we get to chapter 21, we'll see when the new Jerusalem comes down, the foundation of, of the city are the 12 apostles. And so God is promising um, this um, kingdom just as he has uh, throughout. Um, yeah, I also had one other one. I, repeat with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? Let's stop. Thy kingdom come means we are praying that God's kingdom in heaven is coming to earth. And this is what we're reading about in chapter 20. That God's kingdom as established on earth for a thousand years with Christ in charge, no Satan, and people are at peace. This will be a worldwide display of God's, of Christ's glory. It will be an answer to the prayers of the saints. If you were a persecuted Christian in John's day, what kind of a blessing would this prophecy be to you? That all of the trials and tribulations that you have undergone are going to be replaced where, where evil is gone and you and Christ will reign on earth God's kingdom will come to earth for the Jews who are blessed and for the Christians uh, forever. Uh, <clears throat> so the tribulation martyrs will be raised from the dead and they'll be given glorious thrones and rewards and the church will share in the blessing. So during the next verse, we're going to read the sixth of the seventh of these Beatitudes that we've been tracking in Revelations. Uh, these blessings that we've been reading are not earned, but are part of the believer's inheritance when he believes in Jesus Christ. They will share in Christ's victory. They will reign as kings and priests with him and never experience a second death. We will have died once when we leave our earthly bodies, and we will be raised again, and that will be it. We will not suffer. A second death. <clears throat> uh, men have often longed to live good lives and long lives and be free from war and sickness and even death. And as uh, as Carolyn knows, as a medical person, that's one of the things you want to treat 
and try to achieve is, you know, the elimination of sickness and elimination of death. We know that can't happen. <clears throat> Men have unsuccessfully tried to create their own utopias for years and years, but it will only happen when Christ reigns on David's throne, um, that his kingdom will come on earth and will be free from Satan's oppression. And so verse 6 tells us, Blessed and holy are the ones who take part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. They will serve as priests of God and as anointed, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That's a terrific blessing. So this all sounds great, right? <clears throat> but not everyone will be truly born again as the millennium progresses. So the fourth of five events to occur at the close of the millennium is that Satan will be released and permitted to leave, lead a final revolt. It's hard to imagine in this world of peace and prosperity and Christ reigning on earth that there would be people who would be dissatisfied and not believe in the Lord. I mean, <laughs> but we are utterly hopeless as people um, you know as proof of the heart of man is desperately wicked and we can only be changed by God's grace what a tragedy people living in a perfect environment under a perfect government of God's son will rebel against the king a perfect environment cannot produce a perfect heart this sounds a lot like the Bible's beginning. Think about the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. We're in a perfect garden. They walked hand in hand with God, and yet their free will led them to be disobedient. So, and then verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. So this is why God kept him locked up and had one more task for him, and that was to rally the wicked after the millennium. And he will crawl out of the abyss in order to deceive the nations located at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, as Ezekiel described them, and that short verse I read out of Ezekiel was those chapters in chapter 39 where, where Ezekiel describes this final battle between Gog and Magog. <clears throat> in order to rally them together one final battle, they are in number as Grains of sand on the shore, they marched in unholy array over the expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and their beloved cities. And as they lay siege to the city, fire rained down from the heavens and incinerated them. And the devil who had been deceived them, who had deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown, and the unholy trio will be tortured day and night throughout the ages. Um, so Satan gathers an army of those living during the millennium uh, and revolts against God. And God deals with this revolt very quickly, and Satan is cast into hell, the lake of fire, where the Antichrist and the false prophet have been for the past a thousand years, or whatever you believe. So those five events, celebration in heaven, Christ returns, establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Satan is released at the end. And then the final event. Anybody guess what that is? All the sinners will be resurrected and judged. So all the, all the believers in God have been taken care of. Uh, those who have died in the past, those who died during the tribulation, uh, the people who believed on earth during the rapture, all of those have been collected and have gathered with the uh, multitudes in heaven with the Lord. And the only ones who haven't are the dead who were non-believers. Um, this is the last event that will occur before God ends history. Sinners are judged. Now this is different we talked about judgment before with Christ where he judged Christians, but what he was doing was 
judging to see what their reward would be. So if you were um, somebody who, as Christ told us, somebody who was sick and you helped the sick, somebody who was clothed and you helped them, was not clothed and you helped them get clothed, uh, your rewards would be greater than somebody who didn't act. Um, you know, Pastor talked about the book of James and a lot of theologians um, have trouble interpreting James because James says if, if, you, if you have faith, then your works will demonstrate that. And he, he so emphasizes it that it almost reads some places where you have to have good works to be saved. Well, that's not true. And that's what not, not what James meant. But he was so adamantly for what you should act and look like if you are a faithful believer in helping your fellow man and taking the actions that were necessary. And so when Christ judges the Christians, he's judging them for their rewards. This is a different judgment. This judgment has to do with <clears throat> only unbelievers, and there will be no rewards. <laughs> Heaven and earth are going to go away. After this judgment, time will end. History will end. There's no place left for sinners to hide. Jesus will be the judge. Sinners will be rejected. Um, sinners who rejected Christ in life must now be judged by him. Uh, books are opened, and there are a couple different books. We've talked about the Book of Life. The Book of Life is one that has people in it who have on their plus side believed in Christ, right? They have God's grace. They have the atonement that comes with the belief in Christ. So that's those folks in the Book of Life. There are other books that John talks about that um, Christ will look into. And so as a non-believer comes up out of the depths of death, and faces Jesus, he will look in the book and see what this person did, and that will be judged against him, and he will look in the book of life to see whether or not that has been atoned by his belief in, in Christ, and then he will make the final judgment. And um, you're just going to have to come back next Sunday, because we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we're not going to talk about that till then. Um, we've got about two lessons left. We'll uh, talk about the judgment. We'll get into chapter 21, uh, where we have the New Jerusalem, the, the final end of history, come to earth. And then we'll conclude it with John's epilogue, epilogue in chapter 22, and I'll try to kind of summarize uh, what Revelation has been for us in these the past couple months. So let's bow our heads for a minute of prayer. Well, Father God, thank you for uh, this study. I sincerely hope that uh, what I've presented is meaningful and provides us some true understanding into what the book is designed to tell us. Um, may we always look to Scripture to confirm our faith and to help others become uh, disciples of Christ. Be with us now as we go about our week and bring us back again safely next Sunday for the, some of the conclusions to what we've been reading. In thy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>